Hello and good afternoon. I'm Mary Miller, director of the Getty Research Institute, or the GRI as we usually call it. We start our program today by acknowledging Getty presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. I particularly welcome those of you who are in other time zones, and especially those of you who are joining us on Zoom right now or who may watch this on YouTube at some later date. Um, on this occasion, we hope and we have people subscribed to join us from Australia, Canada, Chile, Colombia, uh, most of all, Mexico and Los Angeles, our, our principal Zoom attendees. So truly welcome to everyone. We dream a lot for the best unintended outcomes at the Getty Research Institute when we bring together scholars on a theme or two or around a project, whether it's African American art history or the Levant and the Philistines, as well as an overarching theme each year. And this year, it is art and migration, which particularly addresses mobility, which is to say the movement of people and objects and materiality. And sometimes it's all three. What are the things you carry with you when you change place in what is sometimes a kind of silent performance and how you may return to certain materialities in your practice as an artist, for example. There have been many of those very best unintended or slightly scripted outcomes this year, chance encounters that then lead to renewed conversations time and again. That's what we're here for today. This year has been one when possibilities have truly borne fruit and especially in the context of scholar housing, the apartment building that the GRI occupies on Sunset Boulevard, and sometimes even on the shuttle from the apartment complex where our scholar communities include an artist in residence, researchers at the museum, and at the Getty Conservation Institute, all creating a cohort of alumni to whom we can turn time and again. This fall, Laura Gutierrez and Felipe Baeza discovered that they had lived parts of their lives in parallel. Both born in Mexico, they came to the United States as children old enough to remember and to know the country of their birth and young enough to sop up the culture of their new home and which in both their cases was Chicago. Neither of them lives there now. They met this fall here in residence at Getty. Laura Gutierrez is associate professor in the Department of Mexican American and Latinx Studies. Her primary research and teaching areas of, uh, are in Latin American, Mexican, Latinx, and particularly in embodied practices, gender and sexuality, alongside questions of na nationhood, modernity, and the transnational. She was in a doctoral program at the University of Wisconsin at Madison when she turned to performance studies, of the, particularly in the work of Luis Alfaro, Guillermo Gomez Peña, and now Bustamante, performers who dared in the way they used their bodies and words, as she described it in a recent interview. This spring, she has been completing a book Binding Intimacies in Contemporary queen, Queer Latinx Performance and Visual Art. Felipe Baeza was in, uh, went to the Cooper Union from high school and where he studied printmaking. And after a few years, he came to Yale for his MFA where I met him when I, uh, before I left Yale for the Getty. He signed up for my class on ancient American art in the Yale University Art Gallery. And at the second session, we were able to examine pre-Hispanic works in the collection personally. I handed him a small cup in the shape of a gourd and each member of the class held it in sequence. I asked everyone to do something with 
the thing that they were holding. Some held it gingerly, some didn't want to touch it at all, some tried to pour from it or drink from it or simply turn it around. Others put it on the table to see if it wobbled. Felipe looked for cracks. A few years later, Felipe's work was featured in Desert X, which many people in the audience today have attended, and of which a new iteration just closed. Given how much of his work directly addresses the mobile fragment, I was so pleased when he accepted our invitation to be artist in residence at the GRI this year. Well, enough from me. I bring you Laura and Felipe. Please welcome them. How's it going? Guys, can you hear me? Uh, is this on? Is this one on? Yes. Try again? No. Good? Thanks, Mary, for that introduction. Yes, thank you, Mary. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us here this afternoon. What a pleasure to be in conversation with, um, as Mary just said, someone I recently met whose work I you know, had come across multiple occasions in years past, but uh, met in person just last September. And I now consider to be a kindred spirit. So it's, it's been very sweet. So um, this is also, thank you for um, inviting me to be in conversation with you, Felipe. Uh, we're just gonna call each other by our first names, if, if that's okay. Um, I thought that I would um, get us started with just um, a very sort of brief, kind of, not explanation as much, but kind of like a, a way for us to sort of come into the space with um, the concept that uh, we're using here as our, as our title. Um, and then just sort of to explain a little bit of that and get us started. And then we have a sort of a series of, of things we want to touch on. Not sure we'll get to everything, but, um, but we'll see. So one of the things I, um, that we dis one of the many things that we discovered as we met here um, at the Getty in September was also our um, kind of shared reading list. Like we kind of turned to uh, similar scholars, similar thinkers, to help us kind of um, manage the way that we live and work. And um, among the many kind of thinkers and, and uh, scholars that we um, just kind of were drawn to or, or whose work and, and words inspire us, you know, are people like, you know, Saidiya Hartman with her concept of Wade Ward, Wade Wardness, or um, Fred Moten with uh, Fugitivity. Um, but we've also like had a really long conversation about Gayatri Gopinath, um, a person who we both admire um, and consider a, a friend, uh, a fellow traveler, um, whose work on Unruly, particularly her book Unruly Visions, in, um, has inspired both of us. Um, I know that Gayatri's work in, um, in my own research and thinking is, is there, um, but definitely also in yours with, you know, some of your shows and, and unruly forms and, and so forth. So I thought that I would kind of like just kind of bring us there and, and I kind of have a, a little bit of a, I have this little cheat sheet as I want to kind of read um, just a quote from her book, Unruly Visions, as you're um, sort of partaking of the, uh, the images that are being um, shown uh, right above us. But um, in Unruly Visions, uh, Gopinath writes, it is in the realm of the aesthetic. Oh, by the way, Unruly Visions you know, centers visuality and uh, queer um, aesthetic practices. You know, um, So just sort of keep that in mind. And in this quote, it is in the realm of the aesthetic that we can excavate the submerged commingled histories and become attuned to the continuing resonance um, in the present as they echo both bodies and landscapes. And I thought that that was a good quote to sort of 
use here today as you know we both think of unruly not just in terms of the work that Felipe does but also our own sense of self right so just get us yeah going. well first of all thank you all for coming um and Laura I mean what a privilege is to be in conversation with you and what an amazing experience has been meeting you here um yeah in regards to unruly the unruliness or unruly visions or bodies I mean Gayatri has been quite influential in that in my work, but also in my day-to-day -day living of embodying that unruly self. Um, but I guess what the unruly body or the unruly um, vision offers us is another way of seeing or inhabiting the world that through a normative lens will be unimaginable. So I think that's what I also try to channel within the work, but also within my day-to-day -day life of how do I make this life worth living under these restrictions, right, that are outside of my control. Um, and I guess I also try to do that materially, too, with the work, right, that the work gets built in these sort of layers, right, where sometimes the bodies are either blending with the background or the bodies are the landscape themselves, which is quite important, where I also try to set both the content and materially together, always thinking about that, um, that unruliness where the body is not quite accessible to the gaze right away, that you have to, as a viewer, I would want the, the viewer to spend time with the work and the work for it to kind of reveal slowly, right? Um, so I also try to challenge that with, with my materials in regards to the unruly body. So I thought that, you know, I, we want to come back to your work, but um, I thought that what we could also share with all of you is, um, our own sense of unruly bodied, how we, in some ways, I think, I, you know, I like to sort of think about um, my own place in the context of, you know, right now, the Getty, right? You know, um, very privileged, you know, sort of um, art institution, um, never having sort of imagined that I would one day be sitting here with someone that has a very, sh a very similar history as, as me, right? Um, and how kind of like unruliness or these other kind of concepts that we've been kind of tossing um, around is, is also important for us to sort of think about in relationship to like how we might feel as we are somehow uncomfortable here at the Getty, um, how we're also are disrupting the normative in so many ways, but are also kind of not feeling a full sense of like, do we actually belong, right? So kind of just summing up like, yeah, I crossed this country illegally, you know, as, as people would say, I was smuggled in as a child, um, taken to Chicago. I was nine years old and, you know, it was a, a story as many people who are probably listening to us um, have shared, but um, yeah, like economic migrant to this country, never even imagining that, you know, uh, a life in academia was possible. It just sort of, you know, how, how, how did we get here, right? So. I mean, that's great. I mean, th I think that's the unruliness of it all, that we're still here and thriving, right? I mean, obviously I never had imagined this possible, right? And it's not that I didn't have the vision, right? I think that things have just been falling into place. Um, and part of that unruliness, as I mentioned when we talked, is, is, is finding that collective and finding that community as a mode of survival, right? That I feel like, I mean, you're navigating academia and I don't know how you do it. <laughs> um, I don't know how you navigate the art world. And so. same too, and it's such a murky world and I think it's it's that that, that um, mode of survival, and it's creating, you're carving your own path, right? That at the same time, similar trajectory as you, I, I came as a child, and and to this day, I'm in this weird immigration limbo that, you know, I'm like readjusting my life every two years, right? So it's also part of that unruliness is like learning how to thrive in those two years, right? Without thinking, all right, well, um, so I think it's a constant learning too, I think for myself of like also ideas of belonging have changed over time for me. 
right? Where I think there was a point in my time was like, oh, how do I blend in? Or how do I, like, I wish, you know, I had some kind of status. Where now it's quite the opposite. It's like, what is it to desire something that doesn't desire you? Um, and a full rejection of that. It's like, no, I'd rather, what, what would it be to live outside the norm, right? What would it be to, in other ways, going back to a fugitive state to reject these sort of normative notions of being and try to embrace other notions of being, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, same, same. Um, <laughs> trying to find ways to to thrive, essentially, but without like that sense of like, you know, do belong to an institution, but how do I make, you know, a, a sense of the institution that is not necessarily, I'm not wedded to it, right? But I exist on the margins even of that institution, right? So. Um, I know that there are some some grad students watching from from Austin, Texas, and um, other colleagues perhaps. But I also, you know, and and they know that these are these are some of the things that we talk about, right? So I I'm also with you, right? Yeah, I mean, I think navigating those institutions. I mean, obviously, my undergrad experience was very different from my graduate experience, and I feel like we're all kind of traumatized from our graduate experiences in some way. Um, <laughs> But, um, and we're still triggered by them. <laughs> but I think what allowed me to survive those experiences was to find my people, whether it was just one person, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of changed that experience dramatically for me, right? And, um, and just encountering new people on the way, obviously encountering Mary along the way in my experience was extremely fruitful, uh, building that relationship. Um, and I think, you know, it hasn't been easy in many ways, I think, you know, Obviously, people read my CV and it's like, oh, that's amazing. You went to, you know, undergrad at Cooper Union and and eventually Yale. But the reason I ended up at Cooper Union was because at that time, undocumented individuals were not allowed or had minimal resources to higher education. And that's when I went to Cooper Union, not knowing what Cooper Union was, only knowing that Cooper Union at that time was fully funded, right? So my first day in New York was my first day of orientation. I literally took a Greyhound bus to New York right um and carving that space for me um and i think that's and i think ultimately I, learn, I learned this from my family and people i grew up with that under these sort of fixed notions restrictions you kind of carve out a space to seek out those resources right that it wasn't easy but ultimately you're able to carve some kind of path along the way collectively yeah no, I mean, as someone that, you know, went to school, because by the time that I went to college, um, I already had my green card, so my my belonging in this country is, is different than yours. Um, but I also do know that, you know, and, and I went through uh, all of my studies, undergrad and graduate studies, uh, to public institutions, like big, you know, state institutions that had support and they were nominally, you know, affordable for you know, someone um, with uh, poverty status and, st and stuff. Um, but I also know that in, in your case, it's like state institutions, because of the different state legislature started sort of like clamping down on like, you know, uh, admitting, admit, admitting um, um, undocumented, you know, status students. So you had to go to private schools for that. And I'm glad that Cooper Union was there for you to offer you that. Yeah, I mean, I think I would speak to that in regards to how that um, institution was extremely progressive at that, obviously, at that time and, and at that moment and what we were going through, um, but also transformative in my art practice, right? Because I didn't really have an art background prior to Cooper Union. Like, I didn't know what critiques were, you know? I didn't have mm -hmm. sort of that background with me, um, but it was there where obviously this sort of foundation of how I work now is very much owed to that institution, right? And not really from grad school. I think grad school for me kind of just felt like a residency <laughs> where I just had the time and space to to think and make, right? Which a lot of us don't. And I think that's also why I took the opportunity to go to grad school 10 years later after I have gotten my undergrad um, to kind of make something that I had been sort of not been able to have the financial means or the space to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that space gave me that. And it was also really transformative in that aspect that it allowed me to have a studio practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I wonder if I can just kind of like get go 
make us go back a little bit in time before you went to Cooper Union. Because I'm also, like, another similar thing that we found out as we talked, um, and I know you grew up in, in Pilsen, in Chicago. I did not grow up in Pilsen. I grew up in the Humboldt Park area. So I grew up, you know, as a Mexican kid in a Puerto Rican neighborhood, um, which had its own, has its own kind of specific kind of, it, it created, me in, in in some ways shaped me, but um, the importance of Pilsen as a community, the importance of the museum in the Pilsen neighborhood, the importance of visual culture in Pilsen, I think was also instrumental for me. Um, Mary mentioned the way that I came into performance studies, um, where I saw some of that early work that you mentioned by Luis Alfaro, now Bustamante. It was actually at that museum because somebody was programming, you know. Um, these performers from from California in you know in uh, in Chicago, but I also know that that neighborhood and that museum specifically had what well, you know was kind of like an early school. Let's just for I me mean, and for you. Definitely, I mean, I think it was quite an amazing experience. I mean, coming I was seven when I left Mexico and moving to Chicago um, to reunite with my parents. Um, I always speak that the transition from Mexico to Chicago was not really that different in many ways, right? That I was just going through another, I mean, it just, this has to do with Chicago being such a segregated city, right? Um, and that's only allowed this to happen that I ended up in Pilsen with people that looked like me. I mean, I went to a, a elementary public school named Jose Clemente Orozco. <laughs> <laughs> and my teachers were Mexican, probably second generation Mexican. So that sort of transition wasn't hard. It's just obviously they spoke a different language at that time. Um, but I think the beautiful thing that we speak of is that I, I didn't really experience Mexico until I left Mexico. And, that, and by that, I mean that obviously growing up in the 90s in Pilsen was extremely transformative in how that neighborhood looked and was shaped into, right? That in many ways, everyone brought this idea of what they could have imagined home and tried to recreate Pilsen, this sort of Mexican, almost kitschy idea of Mexico, right? Extremely colorful. Um, but in regards to also having access to, to, to culture and to art was extremely um, influential in me as a young kid, right? Being able to, you know, on my way out of school, pop into the museum by myself, has been extremely influential. So I owe a lot to that museum. I mean, that was my first and only museum experience for years to be able to allow that, be like, wait, I could come in for free and just look at art and, and not even as a little kid, not knowing, you know, capital art, you know, um, but just experience the work there. It was truly transformative for me and seeing sort of, you know, printmakers from El Taller de Grafica Popular. Um, um, so that's that's been embedded in me, right? But also how that museum and, and neighborhood shaped me, right? And having access, I mean, th there's still a, a public arts program that still exists to this day called Yolo Cali. And there was, you know, it was just extremely cultural at that time. You know, there was a, a radio station called Radio Arte too. Um, and I did all those programs, right? Because I had access to them. So that definitely has shaped me into thinking, you know, um, thinking of obviously the limitations of language as me as a child, but also even now, but having that opportunity to materialize things and make a language through that. And, and those moments growing in Pilsen allow for me that to happen. Yeah, no, I, I, I wanted to make sure that we talked a little bit about Chicago and our, our love for Chicago and also our desire to not ever want to go back to Chicago <laughs> um, as someone that lives in Texas and you in New York. Um, but now I actually want to, you know, as, as the audience has been sort of looking at some of these images that speak in many ways to your um, your trajectory thus far. And, and you mentioned how, um, you know, it started to change, you know, um, your practice has started to change. So I thought that we could talk a little bit about that, um, uh, the forms and how they've, yeah. they've transformed. You know, as, as Mary mentioned, yeah, I mean, I, I applied to, to Cooper with a sculptural portfolio. A lot of people don't know that. So I applied more with a sculptural background. And it was to Cooper that I fully immersed myself in printmaking. And I think what attracted me to printmaking was a sort of the, also the sculptural way of making. You're carving into, you know, into, into, um, into wood, you're either etching onto a plate, right? And but also the layering and the abstraction of that process, right? That it was a whole process to attain to like a final image. Um, so I fully immersed myself in that. Um, 
and then obviously graduating and fast forward, you know, there was a pause there. Um, um, and a quite important pause, this is like 2010, 2011, where I wasn't really making work for years and kind of got myself immersed in, in mobilizing around immigrant rights. Um, and um, and just meeting amazing people throughout the states who were in many ways also going through the same experience I was going to, right? But I also never speak myself as an activist at all, um, but also more like a witness and thinking what can I do when can my art have any role in it, right? Where at that time I felt like my art didn't really have much of an impact where I felt like my body did. Um, and I guess I could speak about this now, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately what we did at that time, this is Obama era, we, part of the actions we were doing, we were, um, we were self-deporting ourselves, basically. So I had done two actions, one in Georgia, one in Alabama, where the process was to, to self-deport ourselves and put ourselves through deportation, and while in that process, finding the cases of many individuals who were just being deported for various reasons. Obviously, if we remember, there was a quota to meet during Obama era, around 400,000 undocumented immigrants needed to be deported. So there was a machine going on at that time. So I think, I and I speak to this moment because it completely transformed me. Obviously the thing that obviously I lived in Chicago and in New York and as an undocumented person at that time, an immigrant, I faced a very different reality, right? That when I was going to Georgia and Alabama, there are folks who were facing another really awful reality, but at the same time, they were also thriving that we're making a life worth living under those restrictions, right? Um, and that completely shaped me in the way I was thinking because my work changed dramatically where I was responding and working with images directly um, and, and tried to shift that, right? That I was working with images that, um, that I was archiving that were mostly images of, of individuals in this sort of like in-between space. And by that, I mean people who were migrating or in the process of migrating. Um, and it made me think about like, what is it to work with the archive, right? And how to work with an archive where you're not recreating the same violence that made that archive. Um, so then that shifted my practice dramatically and thinking, all right, well, you know, I'm, I've graduated and years forward and thinking, well, I've had these sort of set, set of tools within, you know, working with printmaking and what is it to not rely on the press and, and sort of make my studio the press. And by that, I mean that I mostly just use the floor as the press itself, so that's how a lot of the, sort of layers and, and, and textures on them get built sort of like monoprints on the floor. And there's this back and forth of peeling and, and then eventually cutting and forming these, these figures. Um, I mean, in many ways, the, the, the works that you're seeing right now function as a, as a plate. Essentially, the work gets built as a, as a collagraph where essentially there's uh, textures applied to the paper and then I'm able to either carbon into the paper or embed other elements and then sand it. Um, yeah, I, uh, so some of the images that we've been seeing, um, just sort of thinking about having visited your studio and seeing the way that the floor looks, there are no images of the floor, but there's like images of your kind of like your um, your mood board, you know, of sorts, right? The, the ways in which um, you kind of begin to, I mean, like, there are parts of pieces, you know, of, from your collage work that are, um, on the mood board, but also, you know, other things that inspire you, right? And um, I always find it a sort of a treat to sort of see, like, oh, wait, you're into that image too, right? Um, so um, I love that. I, um, I wanted to sort of think about, like, you know, the um, other ways in which the forms the, have also been shifting, right, um, from being much more um, gender specific, you know, from like your collage work that includes, um, you know, pre-Columbian pre, uh, pieces um, to the most recent work where the bodies are not only, I don't, I don't know if androgynous is the correct form, but are sort of more gender fluid, um, or, and also sort of go into sort of the plant or the sort of the animal worlds. And I also want to sort of think about that um, as unruly bodies, right? The ways in which, I mean, again, here echoing Gayatri's uh, work, 
on on unruliness, right? Uh, there's a way in which your your recent work also is sort of you know going to to non-human forms of of life. Yeah, I mean, definitely in the past three years, the work has changed dramatically, right? And I think that's that's what's been beautiful to experience in the studio, not to sort of um, rely on the same tools of making, but also in the same ways of making. Um, I mean, going back, yeah, to the unruly body, right? And I think that's also in regards to, if I'm speaking in regards to this language, it's also pushing the word into this language, right? And leaving all, as an artist, you know, leaving all logic aside, right? Um, has been extremely fruitful for the work, and I think it has gotten to more of a fantastical um, um, way of making that obviously I'm not aligning to a surrealist way of making, but rather to like a magical realism way of making that obviously there's a fantastical but a very real experience that is coming from the work, right? Um, and definitely, I think that's also the idea with fragmentation that I've been trying to explore and push with the work, both in content and materially, right? And thinking um, what a body is and what a body could inhabit, right? And beyond notions of gender or sexuality, right? Um, and I feel like mean, this is like a really early piece. Um, um, and thinking, obviously, how from there the work has shifted to now, right? That it seems more fantastical and I feel like more free, right? That if I was feel like the work felt more fixed in some ways, also in the ways it was made. Um, but definitely that has allowed me to think about broader notions of belonging, right? And, and the ways that the body gets to exist in its various forms. Um. I know that the last time I, I went to visit you he, in the, your studio here at the Getty, you were um, finishing up um, a project uh, for a public art fund. And um, I know that we talked briefly about the ways in which um, they were responding to these, these figures, these uh, pre-Columbian artifacts that sit in different uh, institutions in different cities in the U.S. Um, and um, how you were responding to them. And, and, and uh, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, um, I was asked to be part of this project. Um, it's a public project that would kind of premiere in three cities, which would be Chicago, uh, Boston, and New York. And for a while, I was trying to figure out a way to connect all three locations in a way um, that would speak to these ideas of mobility and migration, right? And in a very different way to work that I've been already doing. And um, idea came to sort of look at very specific objects at the Met in New York, at the Art Institute in Chicago, and at the Boston MFA, uh, and to thinking about these ideas of migration and displacement, you know, as Mary spoke about objects obviously who they're either forced and how these objects have moved right but then through that obviously more questions arose in thinking well these objects are now in these sort of fixed notions of being inactivated on the daily right and what does that mean but also that their function has been interrupted um and thinking like what was what if, what if the function of this object was to never be seen and what if the function of this object was to fall apart over time right and now these objects in many ways are treated in a very clinical way, you know, by conservators, sorry, but <laughs> to, to, to never change, right? And what does that mean in regards to, I would say the violence that these objects have experienced, right? Um, but also that they would carry the name of a wealthy person for the rest of their lives, <laughs> right? But also how these objects get contextualized too. I think, I think the project arose more questions than I ever thought and thinking obviously that I'm still working with the archive, right? Um, and thinking, what is it to give agency to these objects back in some way, right? Um, to speak, like, what would their actual f function be if they were still, you know, being activated as they should be? Or, or I think the question is, should they be returned, or what's the responsibility of institutions, right? Um, is, 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 a, is the answer to return them? I honestly don't think so. I think, you know, we, sp we have spoken about this, in regards to, you know, obviously, you know, if objects pertaining to what is now known as Mexico, if they were to return, you know, they would probably, it would be, be in the same mode of suspension, right? Um, in regards to, obviously, um, 
going back to to Mexico in regards to you know sort of this sort of nationalistic idea of of creating uh, identity through these objects, right? And and how the the National Museum of, of Anthropology in Mexico was very much a cultural project of identity that was made through violence in so many ways to basically extract these objects from various places where where people were still thriving, right? I mean, the main sculpture in the outside, you know, there's a beautiful documentary around that we've spoken to, you know, was subtracted from a community that was still thriving, you know, mm -hmm. to now being exposed, fully activated in front of the museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the documentary um, Piedra Ausente by um, Jesse Lerner and Sandra Rosenthal speaks precisely to, to that um, idea, um, the violence that these objects endure. Um, one of the things that I also like really um, think it's important for us to sort of think about to bring it back to sort of these embodied practices is to sort of think about um, you know the the maker of these artifacts and you also as a maker you know how your practice is so much embodied and I'll just say this um, because one of the things I I don't know I just like fell in love with like visiting your studio when you would carve out your hands to put them in the collages and like just sort of thinking about those like hands in the in the works as your hands but then also your hands making them so I wanted you to also talk yeah to us a little bit about that I mean in regards to the options we we you know sometimes as viewers you forget that that was made by the by individual that it carries history and energy that sometimes we just for we just kind of see it as an object right but that you know touched was touched by hands was molded was made right and so it carries a very specific energy that that uh, uh that we always take for granted i feel like you know it's like there's our term in Nahuatl called shiptala which basically kind of just means that the energy an object or a person could carry that it's so much energy that they have to be destroyed so a lot of these objects were ishiptalas and like what is it to now have all these ishiptalas around <laughs> and being exposed to them it's like um <laughs> so i mean no that's very much embedded uh, also in how the work is made right that there's a very specific attention right that i mean i work extremely slow um so i, I would say <laughs> thank you um but yeah again um just i i feel the energy of like you know, sort of, as particularly with these images that you shared with me from the Public Art Fund project, um, just like thinking about, you know, that you're responding to certain pieces in these institutions. And then also many, many of them are fragmented in ways, like they come to you in fragmented form. So you're like, you know, continuing with this, this sort of narrative of fragmentation. But yeah, no, you're right, Lord, I think, but also, I guess also embracing that incompleteness that is very much part of the work, right? I mean, we're all incomplete individuals and part of the life we have is to complete some aspects of our lives along the way, right? Um, but also I think to think about these objects and their fragmentation and to also think and that they're also thriving and living their functionality is what I imagine this project would do. And another thing that that project um a beautiful thing about that project to go back to the idea of how we didn't grow up going to museums. They were, you know, sort of these things that was not necessarily part of our everyday life growing up as migrant kids in Chicago, except for this museum that, you know, came about in the in the eighties in Chicago. Um like like knowing that, you know, through this project your work is going to be exhibited um in these sort of bus stops in these different cities. Um, it's just sort of like a, think a beautiful way of like, like being exhibited, being on display, your work that is often not necessarily, you know, um, that my parents or my sisters, my sisters in Chicago or my nieces, who go more to museums nowadays, but less, not, not ne necessarily as a, a thing, are going to be able to see your, you know, your work in these bus stops in Chicago, also in New York, and like your audience is going to grow in that sense. 
Yeah, I mean, that's the beautiful thing about doing public works, and I think also questioning how these things happen too, right? Um, I mean, as you mentioned, obviously I didn't grow up going to museums, right? I think the only museum I had visited for years was this museum in Posen. Um, and even to this date, my parents have never stepped into a museum, right? To think about who has access to these spaces, right? Um, and who is welcome at these spaces, right? That I think has, there's a lot of work to do within institutions to be more welcoming into these spaces, but also how to navigate these spaces, right? And ultimately, I think it's also a privilege of time. Like my parents don't have time, right? They're exhausted, right? They're, um, so to have that privilege of like, hey, I'm gonna spend one hour at the Getty, you know, it's, it's, it's and, but it's also to have also that opportunity and have that accessible to you. Um, and, you know, I think for this project itself, it's gonna be extremely beautiful, obviously, to, to also choose very specific locations, right? So we have spoken about choosing locations at Pilsen, you know, and I think to think about my seven-year-old self, you know, growing up in Pilsen, and now, right, it's like, wow, you know, I wish I had access or seen images like that. And what would, I mean, because it does something to me, obviously, those images that I had encountered at the museum and just growing up in Pilsen, um, but also for my family to to have access to these images, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm still trying to um, figure what that would be. Um, but but ultimately, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's something that I've also been trying to, na try to navigate in regards to how I show and how the work gets shown, right? Um, in regards to, obviously, when I've done gallery shows, it's like, you know, who is the work accessible to and who it isn't, right? I mean, those are obviously quest important questions. I realize that we can actually keep talking, but uh, William has just given me the signal that we need to move to um, a question and answer moment. So um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you so much. I think we have, uh, yeah, we have questions that are, that are coming in from, from Zoom, but let's, let's, um, I'm actually going to take the, the privilege of being up here at, with the microphone to um, ask a question about the, some of the materiality. And this question, I want to go back to the floor in your studio and what it means to be making, Felipe, prints where you are using, you're using the hard surface to nevertheless capture what in some cases has the quality of wood, of fingerprints, of the grain of skin. Uh, is there, is using this particular, um, whether that is the materials you're using or whether it is the outcome um, that is somewhat um, just fortunate that this is what is being yielded, but how are you using in a way um, the container of the space, the room, to actually then create and generate some of the some of the um, some of your works. Yeah, I mean, I think the work itself. I mean, as I mentioned, the studio in many ways became the print shop, and by that I mean I don't have a press at all, but using the actual floor as a press, where part of the studio is split in a way where half of it is basically cover in plastic where essentially that's the press and I'm essentially just laying pigments in water and basically just laying the paper on top and letting the paper absorb as much as it can. So obviously there's elements of surprise and fooling outside of the control where I'm not able to control what I'm gonna get. So a lot of the actual treatments of paper go through various passes, right? But I'm also extremely frugal in the ways that I never throw anything. As a lot of who's on my show, it's like every little tiny scrap of paper gets saved. Um, and so essentially the work itself is giving life to other work. You know, like this was a presentation in Venice and all those scraps from Venice gave life to the show I had, a, you know, a few months later. Um, um, but it's been obviously, a lot of it has just been experimentation and getting to, to that way of making, you know, because I always felt like painting traditionally never spoke to me in a sense. Um, and kind of, I feel like I'm always, I feel like I'm trying to get back to 
and the way that I've been making now, trying to get him back to sculpture in a way, I feel like they're in many ways how I'm able to carve into the paper or into the panel and embed these elements is, is speaking to that sculptural language that I feel like I've been sort of itching to get back into. Yeah, um, um, if we could have the microphone here, down here in front for, do we have a microphone in circulation? Yes, thank you so much to Andrew Perchuk. Thank you both for a wonderful conversation. Um, I wanted to ask you, Felipe, what Caliban uh, means to you, the, audi the series Adioso Caliban. I was thinking that having seen a recent production of The Tempest, Caliban has long been a very problematic figure, but in more recent productions, as the sole indigenous inhabitant of his island, uh, there's been a lot of rethinking of the, the character. And then, if I'm correct, on the other hand, that was also a term that Columbus used uh, as a derogatory term for the indigenous inhabitants of uh, some of the islands in the Caribbean. True, yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, in regards to that series, was thinking, you know, in regards to monstrosity as, as something powerful, right? And using these same tools that were created to, to um, using these other mechanisms that were created, right? To kind of subvert and take back that sort of agency from them and own it. So that project itself, obviously, going back to this idea that I mean, was extremely frugal, those were clippings from previous previous collages that kind of became this other book um, and, and project of thinking of, of, of monstrosity and the power that it has, right? And, and I think that collage allows that to happen, right? To have these very specific conversations with two images that have you know, no connection at all from, you know, a thousand years apart to be, to have a very specific conversation. But it also spoke to the idea and consumption of both images, you know, and, and to be um, clear, these were images mostly from pornographic magazines, but also images and catalogs of mostly Mesoamerican works, right? To think about how these objects in many ways became desirable and stopped being their object, right? and also how pornography functions that way where the body's dismembered and desired in different forms, right? And what is it to mesh these two things, right? If I could just interject, I mean, I just think that, you know, Caliban has been in so many ways reclaimed, particularly by, you know, um, writers and thinkers and artists in, in Latin America, particularly queer, um, because of that powerful sort of source of monstrosity and so we have a, a yeah, we'll put the, uh, put, uh, if we can have the microphone right here. Gracias, Felipe y Laura. Um, you were talking about how, you know, this public art project, I understand you're questioning how they're going to be preserved, how they're being embedded into the future in maybe a way that that was not their original purpose. And as an artist, I've been asking myself about the future of my work. Have you had thoughts about the future of your work? How do you want it preserved? I mean, you don't have to expand a lot, but any, any thoughts I would appreciate? Well, I mean, to conservators, nightmare. I mean, I, as Mary spoke, you know, it's... I don't know, I mean, I'm not an artist who thinks of like, oh, I want this to last forever, right? And I think that's a question that I would never want to sit with while making the work, right? Um, you know, I'm not like, you know, working with archival materials <laughs> all the time. Um, um, yeah, I mean, but in regards to the public work, you know, I was invited by Desert X and, and part of my hesitation was to be like, well, I don't want this to be just a, like a one moment spectacle. And what is it for the work to sit a bit longer than that? And if I'm not mistaken, mistaken that was the first time a work has stayed past, I mean, still up. Um, um, 
but but in regards to like what I'm making in the studio, like I I don't think I could ever sit with that question, you know, like would this last a hundred years? I don't think it, I wouldn't want the work to last a hundred years. But I see a question over here. Hi, is this? Yep. Okay. Thank you so much for that. That was a really wonderful talk to get to hear you talk about everything from your perspective and talk about how it relates to you, but also how it relates to the larger communities, especially those who are not always intertwined with museums and arts and kind of this access to culture. And that's kind of what I wanted to ask you about was accessibility in museums or art centers. What can we be doing as kind of the artistic community, the community that loves to go to museums, what do we need to be doing to kind of turn this thing on its head to make it more accessible to communities that maybe either don't have the time? Do we need to extend museum hours? Do we need to have more perspectives from people of different backgrounds consulting on the art that's already there? Do we need to have more exhibits? What would you think is the best way to tackle that? I don't, I don't know. I think who works here. Um, <laughs> well, I think, well, free parking. You know? <laughs> No, but I think it, it, I think it, it starts within each department. There's a lot to do, right? I mean, I think as an as a, as a visitor, as an artist, um, you know, if like if if the museum does not respond to the population, then there's something wrong <laughs> with that institution, right? And I think slowly, and it shouldn't be radical that they should be labels in a different language, right? But it's, it is radical right now to be like, oh well, you know, we have it in Spanish. Right, but I think there's a lot of work to be done, and I think not just you know within collections, right, within educational departments. I think it's it's like shaking the whole. It's like rebuilding again. It's like let's just demolish it all and build. You know, it's like, um, but, but essentially, I think that's what it is. You know, I think um, I think that's that's very layer. You know, I think you know speaking to my experience and my family, you know. I would speak. Oh, I would talk about the experience. You know, I first remember when I went to the MCA in Chicago. I was extremely frightened to go in there because I was like, "Wait, how do you like? How do I get in? Like, do, what do I need to do?" And and I think those spaces make you feel like that. There's something about those spaces, right? You know, I could just imagine a visitor coming here, you know, who has never been to the Getty, you know, going up the tramp and you know, then ending up in this, you know, white striking building. There's, we, I don't know, I think there's a lot to be done. Um, um, I don't know. <laughs> You're looking at me as if I have the answers. But I subscribe to free parking <laughs> um, <laughs> to start. Because um, I think accessibility, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a way. And then er, I also, yeah, er, co sign on everything you said. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have the actual answer. <laughs> and I think something really important, Felipe, that you said earlier is that it's also the accessibility of time. You know, if you're working two jobs, going to a museum, why would that ever occur to you? Um, it, it's just, uh, it, it's, one of, it's one of the biggest challenges when you have, uh, when you take things that you have determined to have uh, culture has determined to have a certain value, and then you lock them up in really safe, beautiful places, and how you, um, and, and you say, as we do at the Getty, that the museum is free, please come, um, but what it means, all of the steps it takes to actually be there and to know what you're supposed to do when you walk in the door. It is... Th these are enormous obstacles, um, and we are we constantly have to be finding ways that bring new audiences. And if you once you've walked through that across that threshold, um, how how that becomes a place where you can then say, well, now now I could do it again, and is and what would be and now I know there's something that I want to do and be there again. Um, yeah, there's another question right near the microphone. Thank you both so much for this conversation. It was, it was wonderful to, 
to hear the exchange. Um, I've been thinking about the, the concept of intimacy and how it, it, it functions for, for both of you, right? Um, and I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more, Felipe, about how you get the viewer in that headspace, right? Um, both in terms of your process, but I mean, you're making smaller scale works and and the detail is just so incredible, right? Um, and I I look at how you treat the body, like there's such precision in the anatomy. Like I love how you do hands. <laughs> like it's so um, performative too, in a way. Um, and for for Laura, why did intimacy intrigue you so much that it became this framework um, for your book? Yeah, I mean, I would go. I mean, I think maybe I would speak to the role of intimacy and beauty in the world. I think beauty has been also such a term that, you know, going through, I wouldn't say undergrad, but mostly grad school, where it feels like a term you never spoke about. Like, nothing should be beautiful, right? Um, um, yeah, but also the intimacy in how the work gets made, right? I mean, I don't, I don't. I make the work. I don't work with assistants, you know. Besides my multiple personalities in the studio, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's that sort of work that you just like, you know, especially also working in very s different scales. Um, it's um, like I enjoy that process of cutting and 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 sanding and embedding these things, but also when they get shown, you know, also that role, the role of intimacy that happens within the work and the viewer, right, depending on, on the actual scale of the work, right, when it's smaller, you know, the work is kind of just meant to be visible by one viewer at a time, right, and I think different taxes are used where sometimes I embroider into the actual panel and and the actual work gets activated by the air and the environment or, and the environment or the breath of the viewer, right, where it's almost like kinetic sculpture and it's responding to the body. Um, I guess the other tactic, you know, that I do is obviously color functions a lot in the work. Where sometimes, as I mentioned, either the figures or 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 objects in the work kind of just blend in with the background. There's, there's really no. There's sort of an interaction with the foreground background. Where, as a viewer, I would hope you would spend time with the work, and it slowly tries to reveal itself. Right. Um, um, so I, I enjoy those those sort of tactics that I'm using. Obviously, texture is extremely crucial that obviously someone, you know, gets sort of drawn into, wait, how was this made? Wait, how is this constructed? Um, so I, I, I hope that those moments are happening and are being activated by the viewer. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, I, um, you know, I, I think I didn't really talk much about my work today here. But you know, someone that is familiar with it, a fellow uh, scholar here at the Getty, um, from my talk and our conversations, you're aware that I also sort of think about intimacy, and I think about intimacy. You know, like I, I love your answer, Felipe, because it's those kinds of things that I'm paying attention to, like also what you mentioned. You're also drawn to the hands, you know. Like I was enamored, you know, with the, with the hands and the way that they brought me in in an intimate way. Um, but I'm also sort of thinking about intimacy in relationship, not just to you know, like the ways in which objects or works of art are you know proximate to each other and that intimate kind of relationship. But I'm also sort of thinking about you know my relationship to the artist as, as something intimate. Um, and I'm sort of thinking about, you know, um, um, this conversation, one of my other concepts in the work that I'm finishing um, this year um, is Conversation Cocoon. So it's very fortunate that, that, um, that I'm sort of ending my time in LA with another conversation because conversation or conversation cocoons are, um, are something I'm mobilizing in that, in that book project, um, something that comes from Sandra Ibarra, uh, another, another artist that I'm working on, working on in that book. But, you know, this is kind of like a sort of a full circle moment where I'm ending um, my time at the, in, in LA, basically, with a conversation with Felipe and our, our relationship and the proximus, proximity that our time here has um, 
kind of yielded kind of an intimate sort of connection where we're able to like, um, yeah, just just talk about life and, and work. Um, yeah, that's kind of a way to answer a, a shorthand. Laura, there's another question that's come in on Zoom, which is whether you could talk about, you've just answered the question of some of the direction of your own work, but could you expand on the concept of the unruly? Um, I, I mean, I, th I think, again, I, um, I think about unruly, you know, beyond what I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, sort of drawing on, on, um, on um, Gayatri Gopinath's work and the way that we discussed it, right? Another way in which I kind of also sort of think about unruly, particularly unruly bodies, is because I do pay attention to embodied performance and I particularly pay attention to performance practices that are, you know, sort of pushing against our, our uh, pushing against or, 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 or defying the normative, right? Um, are, you know, refusing, I think is another concept that, you know, that we were also talking about and tossing about as, as a useful concept. Um, and those bodies, you know, uh, their, their physicality is, is as wayward, as unruly, um, are really, um, to me, are what I imagine as a possibility for the kinds of worlds I want to live in, that, because they are these bodies that exist through their their work through their you know performance work are are moving in a way that is against their you know I'm just repeating myself but um, I'm, I pay attention to to dance for example right Th you know dance forms that are defying you know kind of school kind of uh, or disciplined uh, structures so I guess another way to to sort of say is that I'm really interested in the undisciplined as as movement. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll add to that. I think ultimately it's like creating other practices of being in this world, right? I mean, I feel like unruly and the role of refusal is also, I mean, the the work you do, the work that Gayatri does, and obviously, you know, Jose Esteban Munoz, the work he gave us, you know, and I think to quote him is like, I mean, I see a lot of artists in the room and think about that. Also, we're working within that armature of like the here and now, you know, is a prison house, right? And how do we like enact better pleasures of being, right? And new worlds, right? And and ultimately, as he said, is like that's that's queerness. This this re rejection of the here and now and creating new new worlds of inhabiting, right? Um, and I think that sticks obviously with my work. I mean, I, if I have an elevator pitch, it would just be that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that is the perfect place that we've, we've uh, the unruly has become the contain, contained um, um, in this moment. And I um, hope you will join us all for a reception um, in just a few minutes. But please join me in thanking uh, Felipe and Laura for this really instructive conversation. Thank you, Laura.